Okay, here we're going to study PCR, which is short for polymerase chain reaction. The very brief summary of what this is, is we're simply taking a small amount of DNA, a uh, gene in particular, and we're multiplying it so we have many, many copies. This will often be used in research. This could be used for gel electrophoresis, which is a, another video topic. But the key part here is we're taking a very specific single or small amount of DNA, and we're just multiplying it. And this PCR is an efficient way to go about this process. So working with DNA, as I said, we're going to, PCR is going to be for amplification. It's going to be used to increase the amounts of DNA. Gel electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting are going to be two other videos to help you understand a little bit more of how scientists can work with DNA. Gel electrophoresis is going to be separating out of the DNA, and fingerprinting is going to be used to identify individuals, but you need to go through the previous two processes. So we're going to start with PCR. Another uh, good video uh, to watch as far as how can a gene of interest be multiplied, I'll provide you with a link here. Keep in mind all of the slides are available in the description below. So PCR polymerase chain reaction. Uh, where is, what this image is attempting to show is it's amplifying small amounts of DNA to literally thousands of copies in commonly used in research labs. So here we have a, a double-stranded uh, DNA, as we know as our 5 and 3 primes. We're separating that out. We're then replicating each of these um, strands. And then we're taking strands from there. We're separating out those new two strands. And we're multiplying it from there. You can see from this image here how quick we can go from one to kind of an exponential increase, and that's what's important about this process. And this was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1993. So polymerase chain reaction, starting with very small amounts of DNA. This is important, these very small amounts. Sometimes only a few molecules. One can amplify the DNA to enough to detect by electrophoresis. That requires a lot of the same copy. And through these cycles, it's an exponential increase, and that's important. So the basic steps. It requires primers. So we need to have our double-stranded DNA. We need to denature it, which is causing it to separate out primer annealing. This is our primers that are binding to our double-stranded DNA. And then primer extension. We're basically going through and extending out the uh, DNA to multiply it. So a short single-strand sequence of complementary to two to regions on either side of the DNA. DNA or gene of interest. So what that means is the primer needs to bind here and work its way this way, and this primer will bind here and work its way that way. Remember, they're working in opposite directions because DNA is anti-parallel. Those five and three primes come back again. So the denaturing stage. So there's going to be a lot of information here. I provided a link down here with some more um, information. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. I'm going to give you the basic steps. I highly recommend you pause the video and read through these bullet points to help understand this image. So the denaturing step, we're up here. We're starting with step one. We're heating DNA to about 95 degrees Celsius, and the DNA strands will start to separate. This is going to simply break those hydrogen bonds, causing what was once bound together to start to kind of separate out. It's important that these temperatures are kept very close, 94 to 95, you see mentioned here. Because if we overheat it, we're going to denature it to the point that uh, we won't get it back or we're going to break down any proteins or enzymes that we're going to need. So these numbers are very precise. So we're taking denaturing, we're taking our double strand, we're heating it up to the point it's starting to fall apart a little bit. The annealing stage, we're at step two now. During this stage, we're starting to cool. We see 55 degrees, again, 50 to 65 is the typical range. We need our primers to be able to bind to the DNA. We need our primers to be able to anneal to that DNA. And we can notice here some of the bases are listed, and we see it going in opposite directions. So again, highly recommend pause and review some of these. Uh, but it's uh, the annealing stage is the annealing of binding of the primers. The extension stage. Well, as you would guess, where primers have bound, and now we're extending out to replicate that DNA sequence. These TAC polymerase is very important for PCR. TAC polymerase is an enzyme, it's a protein that can tolerate very warm temperatures. Remember, this is 72 degrees Celsius, uh, not Fahrenheit, it's very warm. Room temperature is typically around 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius to give you just an idea 
of how warm this is. And it's going through and copying it, and then we make two new DNA molecules and we repeat the same process. So thermal cycling. The three processes through thermal cycling are repeated 20 to 40 times to produce lots of copies of the DNA sequence. The new fragments of DNA are made during the PCR, also involve templates. This results in a huge number of specific DNA segments being produced in a relatively short period of time. So I move myself up here, looking down a little bit. Here's our single molecule going through one cycle, one molecule goes to two. Going through another cycle, those two molecules go to four. Those four go to eight, eight go to 16. After 10 cycles, we're repeating. We get to 1,024. After 20 more cycles, we end up with literally over a million molecules. So you can see how this exponential increase does occur. Certain things we need. So the PCR tubes do not require, are very large. They don't require a lot of space. So I have an example of one right here. Just to give you an idea of what it may look like compared to a dime, they're not very big. So we aren't decking a lot of area it's compared to a dime. We're not looking at a lot of area here. We're putting a lot into these. So the basic components are the DNA. We need the code to be copied. Nucleotides, because we need to make more DNA. Primers to bind to the specific region we're interested in. Buffers to maintain the pH for the enzymes to work efficiently. And magnesium chloride, which affects the primers annealing and tac polymerase activity. And again, that tac polymerase is an enzyme that makes the complementary strand of DNA. It's high temperature tolerant and doesn't denature. In these little PCR tubes, and this is pretty easy here without having gloves on, but you can see it's, it can be very difficult to kind of open and close these. And we don't just do it once. You can get literally um, entire bags of these. Uh, and you can go through and they're very thin unless it says, it, if it focuses on there, it might say thin walled. Uh, and that's because you want it thin because you want the temperature to be able to exchange from the outside environment to the inside environment. So again, here's our basic components. We see it all kind of mixed in here. Our tech primase, our DNA, our nucleotides, our primer, our buffer solution. All this is occurring in this small little tube. To give you an idea of that exponential increase, kind of putting numbers to it, here's the number of cycles, starting with basically one copy of DNA, theoretically, and going through about 30 to 34 cycles, and you can see how um, large of an increase that occurs. Typically around 30 is what average are run. It would only take starting with one copy. After 30 cycles, you would get to this extremely large number. You could see it only takes 20 cycles to get to literally a million copies, and that just goes exponential from there. That puts it in a graphical form. And it's basically the rate of PCR is 2 to the n, and that's what's causing it to be exponential. So discovery of the TAC polymerase, this is kind of what made PCR possible. It was discovered uh, in, it's a bacteria in hot springs. So here's a hot springs here. You can see a very warm temp, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. This tech virus can operate under these conditions, about 80 degrees Celsius. It would denature most proteins, especially our naturally occurring DNA polymerase. So the discovery of these hot springs and these bacteria able to survive in there, they have proteins that are able to maintain their function even at these high temperatures. So I mentioned it was thermocycling, and this kind of puts it in a graphical form that I think helps explain it a little bit more. So our initial denaturing, that heating up to 94 degrees, occurs for about three minutes. Uh, and then that denaturing process, we're going through our cycles, we go from about extend it for another minute, we drop the temperature down to 55 for 45 seconds. That's allowing the primers to bind or anneal. Then we're heating it up to 72 degrees to allow that extension phase to allow those primers to do their job. And we're repeating this 35 times in this case. You'll see at the very end here, it says go down to 4 degrees Celsius and hold for infinity. What happens is you might turn these PCR machines on at the end of the day. You, they basically automatically run. When they're all done with their 35 cycles, they go down to 4 degrees and just kind of hold it. And that 4 degrees is a relatively cool temperature. And it's basically just keeping it and maintaining um, your PCR tube with hopefully all of your amplified DNA sequence for a long period of time so you can come back and get it without having anything happen to it. Again, that denature step, double-stranded to single-stranded DNA, annealing as those primers are starting to bind, and step three is the extension phase here. We're seeing all these nucleotides bind. 
Just to go back for a second, if you want more information, I did include a link to a PowerPoint that I got some of these great images from. That cycle summary, again, it's kind of the same thing. We've got your pre-denatron, just starting out. Then your 30 cycles, again, it depends on what you want to amplify. 95 degrees down to 52 degrees for that annealing phase. Extension phase, you warm it up. And extension, we carry out for again. We repeat the denaturing phase, so on and so forth. Just to give you an idea, this is a repeated cycle process. Typical PCR attempts and times. So again, this is different protocols, maybe for different DNA sequences in particular. Uh, the DNA train step at 90 to 95, it can be changed on how many C to G bonds occur. Remember, those have, those have three hydrogen bonds versus A to T bonds. Those only have two. And that 25 to 40 cycles depends on the protocol you need to follow. And that stop the reaction at the very end. It holds for four degrees um, for basically infinity or until you come back and attend the machine. As I mentioned, the temperature might change with the primers in the A's, T's, and G's, and C bonds that you may have. Annealing temperature, depending on that primer sequence. And there's a calculator. We're not going to go through and calculate any here. I want to provide you with that. To, so you could see the difference in annealing temperature based on the amount of G and C bonds that occurs. So that temperature, that um, approximate melting temperature, temperature melting, is known as times 2 for A and T bonds added to four times for G and C bonds. They have a greater influence on the temperature that it would take to melt or separate that DNA sequence. So if G and C content is greater than or equal to 50%, start the TM for annealing temperature. So you're seeing that this is altering that temperature. The more G and C bonds, the greater the temperature that's needed to separate those. These PCR machines I've been talking about, this is what they look like. I provided a link to where you can look where they're actually offered. Um, this is simply heating and cooling that specific cycle. They are not the very cheap, despite what they may do. Uh, I gave an example of one here, over $6,000 for one. Uh, you see them commonly in labs, and they vary in price all over, and they all do different things. Uh, however, the basic process is all the same. Some hold more, some have heated lids, some have other fancy features, uh, but they're basically going through that same heating and cooling phase. The history and applications of PCR, again, you can see in the 70s it was first reported that the replication of single strand DNA from a template was um, basically discovered. Then you could see all the way up to 93 when it was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And now they're very commonly used in genomic research, agricultural testing, human identification, and pathogenic um, identification. If you want another summary video on this, I provide a link down here. Hopefully this was helpful in going over what PCR is.